Accounting technical updates. What has the FASB been focused on? Was a live webinar that was originally produced on Tuesday, August 22, 2017. The presenters for this presentation were Michael Hoffner and Janice Snyder, both with McConley and Asbury. Enjoy this webinar recap and visit us online at www.macpas.com for more information about our future events. Thank you, Tyler. My name is Janice Snyder, and I'm a partner at McConley and Asbury. And here with me today is my partner and co-leader of the audit segment, Mike Hoffner. We'll be walking you through today um, some of the major topics that the FASB has been focused on. Um, and we obviously don't have time to cover everything that the FASB has been doing. Um, but we are going to um, cover six broad topics. Um, as you see here on the screen, the FASB counting standards updates issued. So we have a history here of the number of exposure drafts that the FASB has issued um, over the last seven years, as well as the number of accounting standards updates issued so far this year. So we have 11 new ones that were issued and finalized um, in 2017, as well as 20 that were finalized in 2016. So you're gonna see a mix of a lot of those, and some of them even go back to 2014 with uh, the very popular revenue recognition that I'm sure you have all heard about at this point. So our point here is that the FASB has been very, very busy, and we are going to now turn to the six topics that we are going to focus on today. So within these six broad topics, um, we're going to cover 17 of those accounting standards updates. And I'm going to talk to you today about revenue recognition. And that's going to be a big chunk, probably the next 15 minutes of our webinar. Uh, that in itself could be a multi-day course. Um, Mike's going to talk to you about leases. I'm going to come back with a uh, business combinations. Mike's going to walk you through goodwill and intangibles, and I will round it out with compensation and not-for-profit entities. And just for fun, we have one extra slide on the AICPA's project for employee benefit plans that Mike's going to address if we have a few minutes at the end. So this is our focus for today's webinar, and we're going to get started with revenue recognition. Um, so this is topic 606, and this was finalized after uh, nearly a decade of deliberations on revenue recognition. And in May 2014, they issued uh, 2014-09, the Accounting Standards Update for Revenue from Contracts with Customers. This does affect all entities, and hopefully those of you on this webinar who are CPAs and interested in these topics have heard of this by now, as the implementation deadlines are quickly coming up with uh, December 15, 2017, so periods beginning after that, so it'll be 2018 for public companies, as well as um, after December 15, 2018, which is calendar year 2019 for private entities. The one thing to remember with this is you do need um, some comparative data, and we'll talk in a moment about the ways that you can implement this standard. So it's not something you cannot think about until 2018 or 19. Um, so with that, we'll move on to the next slide. Um, as I mentioned, the transition methods allow either full retrospective application or a simplified method. So as you look at these in particular, um, full retrospective means you actually go back and restate all the prior periods presented. So you'll restate your entire income statement and any impact on the balance sheet for all the years. And if you're a public company, all three years presented and a private company, typically two years would be presented or a not-for-profit. You can also do the simplified method, but I want you to make sure you can run this adjustment as a cumulative effect through equity in the year of the change with the prior period presented without this change. However, you still have to go back and look at the previous year and understand the implications of the new standard on every line of your financial statements and show the difference in a footnote. So you have to have the information for the previous year. Um, so definitely something to keep in mind as you'll be accounting for transactions under two different methods of revenue recognition during these transition periods. There are a couple of things specifically out of scope um, of this standard, which includes leases, insurance contracts, financial instruments, um, non-monetary exchanges, and certain guarantees. And I'll also mention here that the Non-for-Profit Task Force has specifically excluded contributions from this as well. Um, so, but other than that, any other revenue coming through your financial statements will be um, affected by this standard. So there is a five-step process to recognizing revenue um, that is laid out in this standard. And as I said, we could spend days on this, and we're going to give you the 15-minute version. 
So I'm going to walk you through these five steps. So step one is to identify the contract with the customer. So a contract has to be present, and it can be written, oral, or implied contract. But as part of this identifying the contract with the customer, you have to have the intent and ability to pay, and collection must be probable. So there is definitely looking at that intention and ability to pay. There's some nuances affecting certain industries, the healthcare industry in particular, that is impacted by that intent and ability to pay. Under step two, you identify the separate performance obligations in the contract. So when they're looking at and defining performance obligations, it has to be a distinct good or service. So that word distinct is really key in the standard for how you would break out these different performance obligations. Step three of the revenue recognition model is to determine the transaction price. So you need to look at, are you being paid a fixed amount? Are there any variable amounts within the contract? Are there any refunds um, that could be applicable? Are there any non-cash considerations as part of this? Sometimes you may be getting stock or something else that could have a different value that could impact your transaction price. Step four, you need to allocate that transaction price to the separate performance obligations. And as you go into the standard, it's very clear that when you're allocating this transaction price, you need to look at the relative standalone selling price. So in order to do that, they do give you a couple of different ways to estimate the relative standalone selling price of a good or service. Um, so you can use the adjusted market assessment approach um, where you evaluate what the good would sell for in the market and look at that for each distinct piece of the performance obligation. You could, a second way to look at it is the expected cost plus a margin approach. So you look at what it costs you and then you know if your business is getting a 15%, 20%, 25% margin on their products across the board or their services, you can apply that margin approach to the transaction price. And there's also a residual approach, um, which you can estimate the standalone selling price by reference to the total transaction price and allocate it to the ones that you know have standalone selling prices and then whatever's left goes to the remaining elements. Um, so certainly there can be a lot to that allocation piece and depending on the industry you're in, that could mean even more. The final step of the revenue recognition standard is to recognize revenue when or as the entity satisfies a performance obligation. And this is important because you can recognize revenue over time. And this is something that really needed to be addressed for the construction and engineering industry to make sure there was some clear language around this. And as you recognize this revenue, as the customer obtains control of the distinct item or service um, that you are providing. So there's certainly a lot behind each of these steps. Um, and we're gonna go through a couple of these definitions that can just give you an idea of how complex some of this can be. So the first definition here, when you look at step one, identifying the contract with the customer, you first have to have a contract, which is an agreement between two or more parties that creates enforceable rights and obligations. Um, in a lot of ways, these are legally enforceable rights and obligations. Uh, but the contract, as you see here, we're used to contracts being written, but these can also be oral or implied. Like when somebody calls and orders something or you order something online, even if it's not completely written, it could be implied by the way you're, you typically do business. Um, so you have to think about the different states you're in and legal jurisdictions and the nuances of your industry. And we'll touch base briefly on the industry task forces and what they're working on. The next definition to look at is the definition of a performance obligation. Um, step two, you're identifying the separate performance obligations in the contract. So here, a performance obligation is a promise in a contract with a customer to transfer to the customer a good or service, and it has to be distinct, as I mentioned, that concept of being distinct is very important, or a series of distinct goods or services that are substantially the same and that have the same pattern of transfer to the customer. So certainly these definitions, you need to keep those in mind as you're assessing this standard. Another definition to look at is contract costs. So the standard here says an entity should capitalize incremental costs of obtaining a contract and amortize it over the life of the contract. And as part of that, you would be recognizing these costs as an asset on your financial statements and on your balance sheet. 
These costs should relate directly to a contract, and the standard gives the example, as I note here, of commissions. It also goes through a number of other things that are um, direct costs, um, but a lot of times we just assume those, like direct labor, direct materials, um, costs that you would charge to your customer that kind of pass through. But commissions is a bit of a new concept for this standard. So it has to enhance the entity's ability to complete the contract, they have to be expected to be recovered um, during the contract. Um, and it does say here that if you're going to complete a contract within a 12-month period of time, you can elect not to capitalize these costs and just expense them if that's an easier way to account for them during the year. So as I mentioned before, there's a lot of accounting standards updates that um, the FASB works on and just related to revenue recognition. Um, they've you know, 2015-14 was the deferral of the effective date. 2016-08, principal versus agent considerations. So they, they have guidance there. Um, performance obligations are surrounding um, licensing. That has its own accounting standard update. Derivatives and hedging, which fall into topic 815. Um, narrow scope improvements, technical corrections. As I said, they're still working on... Um, refining this, and we have 16 industry task forces um, to help address a lot of the issues that they need to cover through each of these industries. So if we look to, to the next slide, we can look at what these 16 industry task forces are, and based upon the individuals participating in the webinar, there are three of these in particular that affect the majority of you. So you see I have highlighted here um, construction contractors, certainly ones when you think of percentage of completion accounting and how will that change and how you recognize your performance obligations over time and recognize them as you're satisfying them. So there's a lot of issues going on there. There's seven in particular, and the task force has finalized three of those construction issues. Um, so certainly keep that in mind. If you look to the healthcare industry, the healthcare industry is one of the industries with, um, they have 10 issues that are out there that they're really focused on. They've only finalized two of their issues. And one of those issues in particular was the application of step one, which was defining the, the contract um, and making sure that you've um, entered into that contract. So you look at healthcare services, they have to have both the intent and ability to pay, and this really focuses in on those self-pay patients and the balances arising from either those co-payments or their deductibles. And do you actually know that that individual has the not only the intent, but also the ability to pay you? So in some cases, this can defer the recognition of revenue ultimately until the cash is collected um, in the most extreme circumstances. So something you need to look at as a healthcare entity. The other issue that they finalized in healthcare is the portfolio approach on how you can group your, your contracts and not necessarily have to look at every single one if their characteristics are similar enough. Um, the other one to touch on here is the not-for-profit industry. So um, they have finalized three of their issues. Um, one of them is that they specifically exclude contributions from the scope of this revenue recognition standard, and they're working on another project for that. Um, tuition and housing revenue is something else that they've finalized, and how you can uh, kind of bifurcate and separate contributions and exchanges was the third issue that they have finalized. So obviously all of the task force are working hard and are working on all of these issues and how, how they would be impacted. Um, um, I just wanted to highlight those top three for those of you on the webinar today. As we move on, this is a revenue recognition topic 606. This comes from the AICPA's website um, and from their financial reporting center. Um, the last they've updated that was June 1st, 2017. Following some of these task force a little more closely, a lot of them have things that are pending or they're trying to move forward. But you see off to the right which ones are finalized to be included in the guides. So a lot of these have some pretty significant gaps. As you see, engineering and construction, there are seven issues, three are finalized. Um, healthcare 10 issues, only two are finalized, um, and some of the other ones as well. You see some pretty significant gaps that they're still working through and finalizing the industry specifics for each one of these and how they will be impacted by this revenue standard. So that was revenue recognition in 
15 minutes or less. Um, as I said, we could spend days on that. So that is our high level overview. If you are looking for um, some more specific examples of the construction, healthcare, and not-for-profit industry that I kind of touched on very briefly, we did do a webinar in June that is archived. You're welcome to go back and listen to some of that those examples. That was 50 minutes just on revenue. So um, something to consider. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike to talk to us about leases. Thanks, Janice, and I appreciate the uh, overview of revenue and the ability to get through all of that in 15 minutes or less is uh, striking. So the, the question I think comes to mind when you look at revenue being a topic issued in 2014, uh, leases being a topic uh, finalized and issued in February of 2016, and here we sit in August of 2017, uh, why are these the primary focuses of our webinar today? And I think the, the reality is as we continue to, uh, to talk to clients uh, and friends in, in industry, uh, reality is that well, these are two significant changes changes that are occurring, and they've come out some time ago now, uh, many folks have not really embarked on the journey. So I do uh, encourage and invite those on the call, uh, and I would use the old adage, tell your friends, uh, get started on revenue, because as you can see from Janice's 15 minutes, uh, there is a tremendous amount of, of things that have been put in place and still coming out that as you unpack your revenue streams, I think you'll realize that even in industries where we didn't expect significant changes, there are little nuances that uh, as you look at contracts and arrangements uh, really need to be paid attention to. So don't waste any time, uh, and I would say the same on leases. And we're going to spend a few minutes now talking about uh, ASU 2016-02, uh, which is topic 842, as I said, issued in February of 2016, really to bring consistency among treatment of similar contracts. So if you go back to the old days, the capital versus operating leases, uh, which is the world we're still in, um, many folks have seen in their careers uh, arrangements that were virtually identical that were treated differently because of very bright line requirements in lease accounting. So I've, I remember instances over the years of clients who had in uh, say 2008 would enter into a leasing arrangement for an asset uh, and the, the leasing company would come to them and say, well, do you want it on your balance sheet or not? Uh, and if you do, we'll tweak it by a half a percent this way and it'll be a capital lease. And if you don't want this year's on your balance sheet, we can tweak it the other way by a half a percent and it won't be on your balance sheet. And in substance, those were the same arrangements, but the accounting treatment became very different. So uh, after years, uh, a decade of discussion and deliber deliberation, uh, we finally have a, a leasing standard uh, which should bring consistency to treatment for all of those contracts that are similar but maybe not quite identical. Uh, as you can see, the effective date for these contracts for public companies is fiscal years beginning after December 15, 2018, and non-public companies uh, a year later. Uh, and one thing that uh, we'll talk about over the next few minutes, uh, the balance sheet impact is significant and I think what we've focused on uh, for the most part, um, many people have focused on in thinking about this, it's a gross up of my balance sheet. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit too about how your income statement is going to change. Uh, your cash flows for these leases won't be different, but your expenses and your treatment of the expenses will be a little bit different from what you may have been used to. So. The first thing to talk about is really what, what is a lease? Uh, and Janice talked a lot in the revenue conversation about what's a contract for revenue. Uh, and a lease definition is really defined as a, a contract that allows an entity to control an identified piece of property plan or equipment uh, that may be owned by another entity or titled to another entity. So what is that contract and what defines that contract? So an arrangement is really a lease or contains a lease if the underlying asset is explicitly or implicitly identified. And what they mean by implicitly is uh, there's only one asset that could fulfill the obligation in that contract. So it may not call out the specific asset, uh, but it's obvious to any reader of the contract what that asset may be. So if an asset is explicitly or implicitly identified and the right to use that asset is controlled by the customer in exchange for consideration, that's the definition of a lease. So it's not necessarily only things that you think of in your traditional lease arrangement. It's not just your vehicle lease or your equipment lease, uh, but we have to dig a little bit deeper and get into this idea of what's an embedded lease that transfers the control of an asset to a customer as part of a contract where consideration is exchanged. So this is one of those topics. Uh, embedded leases isn't new, uh, but certainly is a topic that we could spend far more time 
unpacking examples of uh, things embedded in service contracts that really constitute a lease. Uh, more time than we have today, certainly, but it's something to be thinking of as we go through this conversation and as you do your inventory. Uh, don't stop at the obvious leases as we think about what we have to account for differently, uh, but dig into those service contracts uh, and think about what contracts do I have in place that allow me to control the use of the asset, uh, defined as do I get substantially all the economic benefits from the asset and do I get to direct how it's used, um, not just your traditional automobile lease as we normally think about. Uh, so as the, the FASB went back and forth on different models for leases, uh, ultimately the goal was to align with the international standards, which would be all leases accounted for as one type of lease. Uh, and through our process, uh, FASB ultimately settled in on a dual model for leases. Uh, we have what are called finance leases and operating leases. So a finance lease is something you would think of uh, very similar to a capital lease uh, where we have our asset, our liability, and we have an amortization component and an interest component. Uh, and then operating leases, well, maybe similar to what we would call an operating lease today. Uh, the significant difference would be the asset and the liability will go on your balance sheet. Uh, so as we worked through this dual, uh, dual model, one thing to bear in mind is that the balance sheet component Component, as we'll see on the next slide, uh, the balance sheet component for operating leases and finance leases uh, is really essentially the same. Uh, we record a right to use an asset. We don't necessarily record the asset on our books like we might if we purchased it, but it's a right to use the asset. And we record a liability where we have to pay for the right to use that asset. And that's the net present value of those lease payments. So regardless of the difference between a finance lease and an operating lease, um, the, the balance sheet component is similar. Where we get into things a little bit differently uh, is on the finance lease component, uh, or on the, the income statement component, where, as you'll see, a, a finance lease, uh, as we talked about, is much more like a capital lease. The expense is, I'll call it front-loaded. It's an interest method. So you have interest and amortization expense, two separate lines on your income statement. Uh, and through that interest method, you have a little bit higher expense for your leases at the front end. Uh, and at the back end of your lease, that tails off, whereas an operating lease is more of a traditional straight line rent expense uh, and will be accounted for on the P&L, again, similar to how you've typically accounted for a straight line operating lease, um, although, again, balance sheet's going to look very different. So we're, I do want to point out, though, that uh, most of the commentary on these few slides is relative to the lessee side, and that's because most of the folks that, at least as a firm we work with, and as we've observed uh, who's on the webinar today, um, we don't see a significant number of folks who actually engage in leasing assets to others. Uh, so bear with me as I, I mostly gloss over and ignore the lessor side. Uh, I will say this, if you are on the lessor side and you get into uh, the finance lease side, there is some considerations to get into as to whether it's a sales type lease where the asset um, comes off your books and the sales, the, the profit and loss is recorded at the commencement of the lease or a direct financing lease where the actual recognition of any gain would be deferred uh, until uh, the end of the lease. So something that you would want to get into if you're on the leasing side and you are a lessor, but not something that we intended to get into today. The other thing to bear in mind is statement of cash flow treatment, um, where again, you have operating and financing considerations for a finance lease. Uh, you have uh, cash going out the door for the principal portion of your lease liability as a financing component uh, and the interesting uh, interest component. It's easy to say interesting, although most of you probably don't find it terribly interesting. Um, <laughs> The interest component is considered an operating expense, uh, and operating uh, leases would all be considered operating activities for your statement of cash flow. Uh, a few things that have been clarified and certainly points of discussion over the last decade as this standard has been bounced around and through exposure draft and re-exposure. Uh, and first is what term do I use? So traditionally you would sit down and say I have a 10-year lease with two five-year renewals. Do I include those five-year renewals or not? Uh, and as you may recall, the first version of the leasing standard uh, that came out in exposure draft said that you had to do a probability weighted model where you have to figure out what's the likelihood of using those extensions. And so you might have a 80% likelihood you're going to use one extension and a 40% likelihood you use the second and you have to work back through a lattice model and say I'm going to use 12.3 years for my life. Um, a lot of outcry, a little bit ridiculous. 
Um, so where we've settled in on the final standard uh, is the idea that uh, you would include that extension if significant economic incentive exists for you to exercise. So for instance, as you do your analysis of your lease life, uh, if you've just put a significant capital improvement into your lease space, uh, there's a high likelihood you wouldn't abandon that capital improvement, and so there's clearly economic incentive to stay. If you're in a long-term lease with renewal options that are better than current market rates, there's obviously an economic incentive to stay. Why would you leave and go pay higher rates to go to a different facility or different space? Um, so it's that idea of how do I define significant economic incentive? Um, and that is something that certainly requires judgment, but I would say uh, a reasonable person would generally come to the same conclusion as to whether something does or does not uh, indicate economic incentive to extend. Uh, there is an exemption for short-term leases. Uh, a lessee may elect not to apply the requirements of 842 to short-term leases. Um, and if you do make this, and short-term being defined as it says, 12 months or less, uh, if you do make this election and choose to treat those more on a, uh, an ongoing month-by-month -month basis. Uh, you have to make that election by class of underlying assets. So if you choose to treat, uh, say, short-term leases for uh, computers or cell phones, things that are regularly maybe upgraded, uh, you can't treat some of them one way and others another way. It's treated by class of asset, and once you make that election, you continue on that path. Um, so those uh, expenses will be recognized on a straight line basis over the lease term and any variability in the payments uh, you would record in the period which the obligation is, is incurred. So when that variability is experienced, you record the expense at that point. Um, Another item to think about regarding uh, related party leases, uh, that's often a question uh, and frequently related party leases as we see are not very well documented, uh, but related party leases do need to be analyzed under this topic and we need to understand what the implications of the lease arrangements are, uh, what kind of documentation exists, what kind of history exists between the related parties. So there is no obvious answer for related party leases, but I encourage you to take some time and make sure you understand the implication on related party leases that may be in place uh, in your organization. Um, and finally, there is some clarity as there was not in the past on what rate of uh, interest to use when determining some of these calculations for your P&L and the interest expense uh, and how to record the present value. So flying through about uh, four hours worth of content in uh, eight minutes, uh, I do want to focus most of our conversation though on what I think is the, the most important thing and that is where I started our conversation. Um, we are now a year and a half into the standard being issued uh, and we have uh, high confidence that most of you have already started the process of preparing for transition, but it's not that far away. And if you haven't started, uh, I really do encourage that you begin that process as we roll into fall here uh, and have a plan in place for the next year so that we're like, ready to implement. So step one, uh, develop a list of all those existing contracts. That's again, not just lease contracts as you traditionally think of them, but make sure we scour the existing contracts, service contracts that we have and such. Uh, to ensure that where we may have uh, control over assets embedded in those service contracts, uh, that we understand uh, how to account for those and how to carve those out. Uh, as you enter into new lease agreements going forward, make sure you start to catalog those and add them to the list of your existing lease arrangements and your lease contracts. Uh, once we understand what all the leases that we have in place are, we need to determine how we're going to capture the journal entries necessary, how we're going to capture the calculations and the, the library of information necessary for transition. There are third-party leasing software available to do all this, much like traditional fixed asset software. Uh, smaller organizations with a more confined number of leases may find Excel works perfectly well for this. Uh, and I believe that the majority of our clients will probably lean that way, um, although those folks in the, the retail or large manufacturing with heavy leasing um, may find that the software is just a much more user-friendly process uh, and give you the right answer every time. Uh, we need to understand the financial implications. What does the transition look like? As we talked about a few moments ago, uh, it's a balance sheet gross up, but it also changes the the character of my income statement and when income gets rec or when expense gets recognized. Uh, and there will be an impact on ratios. And so I need to understand how do my uh, how do my both uh, balance sheet and income state based and cash flow based ratios change? So when my stakeholders, my banks, are looking at 
at, um, at current ratio and debt service coverage and looking at EBITDA measures, um, how does this standard change the way that some of those measurements are calculated and how might that impact the covenants I'm bound by or the way the industry evaluates my business against my peers? Uh, and once we understand those implications, I think number five is probably the most important thing, and that's to have the conversations with your lenders, your bonding agents, the stakeholders in your organization, those who look at the metrics and ratios uh, and need to know now that in a year or two, they're going to see very different numbers coming out of your organization when in all economic substance, the transactions haven't changed a bit. So we need to have that communication soon and often, and that's something that should start um, hopefully this fall and into early winter as you start uh, opening the door for the conversations with those who are going to be impacted by these changes. Great. Thanks, Mike. I'm glad we got the two most significant topics um, out of the way in the first half of the webinar. Um, the next couple of topics are no less important. Um, they just may not affect all of you or all organizations. So let's move on to business combinations. We're going to talk about four of the accounting standards updates and again, a high level overview on each one of these as we walk through each of them on the next few slides. So ASU 2015-2 dash 16 is simplifying the accounting for the measurement period adjustments. So this was effective for public companies. They could start using this in their calendar year 2016. And for private companies, it's effective now in 2017. You apply this standard prospectively. Um, and under the previous rules, and still today, when you have a business combination or you acquire a company, you have one year to fully true up that purchase price and that purchase price allocation to your goodwill, to your intangibles. And through that process, you're estimating a lot of the liabilities that may later be concluded by things that occur subsequent to the transaction or there could be specific earnouts. Therefore, your goodwill and that purchase price allocation could be changing up to a year later. So the previous rule said each time that changed and as you trued up one of those estimates, you went back and restated the previous period and changed that goodwill. This now says that those pr provisional amounts or those liabilities that you're estimating, um, you still have a year to kind of true them up, but now you can report them at the time you determine them. And so it's more on a prospective basis rather than going back retrospectively and changing the numbers in previously issued financial statements and reports. Um, so I do think that's very helpful for a lot of organizations to not continuously be reopening previous year's financial statements. So the next one is, um, is at the bottom here, interest held through related parties that are under common control. And um, this is effective calendar year 2017 for public companies and 18 for private companies. And this one can be applied retrospectively because this changes a little bit the variable interest entity model for entities under common control and those related parties. So if the single decision maker and its related parties that are under common control have characteristics of a primary beneficiary, then you have to look to that one primary beneficiary beneficiary within the related party group. You have to pick one that is the most closely associated with a variable interest entity and select that entity as the primary beneficiary before you could kind of say, well, it's a group and no one's really the primary beneficiary. Now you have to make a decision and say, who is the one entity most closely related to this? And they have to be treated as the primary beneficiary of that variable interest entity. So something to keep in mind if you have this scenario um, and you have those entities under common control. The next one related to business combinations um, looks kind of simple. It's 2017-01, and it's clarifying the definition of a business. So the definition itself hasn't changed a whole lot, an integrated set of assets and activities um, inputs, processes, and outputs. They do clarify the outputs piece a slight amount that they contribute to the creation of outputs. But what they've done in this standard is they, they actually call it in the standard a screen that you have to say when substantially all of the fair value of what you're acquiring is in one asset or one group of assets that are so closely related, you have to pause and say, is this really a business or am I acquiring an asset? And they go through a lot of very specific examples of if you acquire a building, if it has you know apartments in it versus apartments and office space and how you're renting that out, though in one scenario, 
it could be considered just an asset that you're acquiring, whereas in another, you're acquiring a business. So the ultimate outcome of that is as you're looking at things through this screen and you go through the standard, is that it is anticipated that fewer transactions will qualify as true business combinations and as business acquisitions and would be recorded more as an asset acquisition. So keep that in mind the next time you acquire a business um, in looking at whether or not you truly have acquired a business rather than an asset. And the last topic related to business combinations is ASU 2017-02, um, clarifying when a not-for-profit that is a general partner um, should consolidate a for-profit limited partnership. So this is very, very specific, but we work with a number of organizations that have these limited partnership entities, and the general partner is a nonprofit. So there was a bunch of standards rewritten and a lot of things that changed that basically threw out this guidance of the general partner being presumed to control an entity, and the FASIO is kind of stuck, saying, we, oops, we accidentally eliminated this, and now there's no guidance for our not-for-profit entities. So what this standard did is it threw that guidance back in and said, yes, if you are a non-for-profit general partner, you are still presumed to control that for-profit limited partnership. Um, and when you look at that, that in most cases would require consolidation. So there are a few exceptions to this, um, which didn't change from this standard, but if the limited partner can kick out the general partner without cause, so they're very specific in this standard, then the limited partner you may actually conclude has control and the general partner may not have to consolidate that entity. And the other exception is substantive participating rights. So if the limited partner in your partnership agreement has so much control over the organization, such as approval of fixed assets, approval of budgets, um, a various number of other things that impact day-to-day -day operations, then they may have substantive participating rights and the limited partner may have control. As I said, these are the exceptions, and this standard does presume that the general partner controls the for-profit partnership, and that in most cases would require consolidation of that for-profit limited partnership by the, by the nonprofit general partner. That was a lot on that standard. <laughs> a lot of tongue twisters there. If it affects you, yeah, I think you know what I mean. If it doesn't, you've just tuned out. So um, hopefully that was helpful for those it affects. I'm going to turn it back over to Mike for goodwill and intangibles. Thanks. And this is another one of those uh, areas that if it affects you, you'll be glad and you'll pay attention. Uh, and if it doesn't, you'll wonder what all the hoopla is about. So for those who have goodwill on the books and have been forced to go through goodwill impairment testing over the last number of years, uh, and those of you who have done that, the hair just stood up on the back of your neck. It's a topic that is uh, is always full of fun uh, and a lot of involved calculations uh, to try and calculate whether goodwill on your books is impaired. So uh, the FASB, in their wisdom, uh, have decided uh, it's time to simplify life a little bit. So those of you who have gone through this, I hope have already heard about this. And if you haven't, uh, I'll be the bearer of good news. Uh, that we've made an effort here in ASU 2017-04 to simplify the test you have to go through for goodwill impairment. So you can see on your screen the effective dates are staggered uh, for public entities uh, and non-public entities, uh, but early adoption is permitted and uh, I would say from a personal perspective uh, I don't see a lot of reason why you wouldn't want to uh, if you have to go through this on an annual basis. So uh, for those in that world, if you remember the current topic uh, 350 for goodwill impairment requires a two-step test. Uh, one is to compare your estimated fair value of the reporting unit with the carrying value. Uh, and if that carrying value exceeds the estimated fair value, you would have to go to step two. Step two is the fun one, where we spend some time uh, calculating the excess of the carrying amount of goodwill over its implied fair value, uh, which the the process is to determine the difference between the fair value of the reporting unit and the fair value of the assets and liabilities included in it. So uh, a lot of valuation process and, and work to get through to determine whether or not we have a goodwill impairment. Uh, and it tends to be one that uh, most folks have sat back and said, uh, I could tell in step one whether there is or isn't, and now I need to go through this incredibly detailed, complicated calculation to determine what the number is. So we step back a little bit and say, uh, very simply, uh, let's get rid of step two. So moving, 
moving forward uh, upon adoption of this standard, uh, we still have to go through step one. So you'll perform your annual or interim goodwill impairment test comparing the fair value of the reporting unit with its carrying amount. And at that point, uh, if the carrying amount exceeds fair value, you recognize your goodwill impairment. Uh, so that step two is no longer part of the equation. Uh, and I, I will go back just a moment and um, and remind us that the private company council did give an exception for private companies to make life a little bit easier. So now we're, we're moving forward to make it even easier at this point uh, as well. So a um, couple of things to bear in mind. There's still an option to perform your qualitative assessment uh, to determine if the quantitative impairment is necessary. Uh, there's some very clear language on whether there is negative goodwill uh, or a negative carrying amount of net assets and what kind of procedure or process you would go through. You obviously never write down uh, goodwill below zero, so you would write it down to zero in that case. And then we also have to, to consider uh, impairment or, or long-lived assets and what might be involved there. Um, one of the questions that has been asked is whether um, you know, at some point in time, I have a write down. I've determined that my reporting unit has a uh, an impaired fair value, and so I write down my goodwill. Things improve, things go better. Can I recapture? Can I write back up? And the the answer there is a, a definitive no. Uh, once that impairment is taken and written down, uh, you cannot recapture that and write it back up. So uh, as we go forward. Uh, the idea here is very simply, let's reduce the complexity of evaluating goodwill. If step one shows us that there is an impairment in the reporting unit, let's use those calculations to write goodwill down to a, a appropriate carrying value and move forward from there. Uh, and if step one shows us there is no impairment, uh, we continue to stop there and go along our merry way. So let's make things simpler. Uh, we certainly have seen a little bit more of that from the FASB recently. I think as we get into compensation next, though, Janice is probably going to make things more difficult difficult. Um, <laughs> but it is a good move as, as we continue to see the FASB recognizing, particularly non-public entities, spending more and more time and effort complying with standards uh, that really have not historically impacted the users of their financial statements. Thanks, Mike. I don't know about more difficult. We'll see. It's not all bad news in these uh, three topics of compensation. <laughs> so we're going to walk through improvements to employee share-based payment accounting, improving the presentation of net periodic pension costs, uh, I don't know about improving. We're getting a little more consistency in how organizations are doing that. And stock compensation, defining what is um, what requires modification accounting. So looking at the first topic, improvements to employee share-based payments. Um, this first address um, all excise tax benefits and tax deficiencies that should be recognized as income tax expense or benefit in the income statement. So there was a little bit of inconsistency as to the timing of this and whether or not these were being recognized as part of the accounting for these share-based payments. And this clarifies that we do have to recognize all of them. The second thing is the entity can make an entity-wide accounting policy election to either estimate the number of awards that are expected to vest, which is what you're required to do now under current GAAP, or to simply account for forfeitures as they occur or when they occur. So I think that gives you a choice there and you need to make that decision as an organization of what's easiest for your organization and what makes the most sense from an accounting standpoint. And then non-public entities have uh, an option here for their accounting policy election to apply a practical expedient to estimate the expected term for all awards with performance or service conditions that meet certain conditions. So you can stop trying to figure out, you know, this one is likely to um, have a term of six years. It has 10 years, but I think they're going to exercise in six or those sorts of things. Um, and you can have a practical expedient for that estimate. So a little bit of good news with some of these policies, should you choose to, to elect them. On the next topic, it's improving the presentation of net periodic pension cost and net periodic post-retirement benefit cost. Um, so this is to get more consistency in how organizations are accounting for this. So for those of you that have pension plans, you typically get your actuarial report, or pension plan or post-retirement plan, and it gives you a number that's called net periodic pension cost or net periodic post-retirement benefit cost, and that's an expense number, and that ends up in your income statement. So this standard says that if you look at the details of that expense number, you have service component um, that you're 
that is recognized as expense each year. There's an interest component, usually an actuarial gain or loss, certain changes in assumptions. There's a multiple components that go into that total expense number. This standard says you have to take the service component only and put it up in income from operations, and the other portions of the expense amount need to go outside of that income from operations and should be below the line. Um, they're very particular on this because I said organizations are all doing this differently and putting this expense. Some are putting it in operations, some are putting it outside of operations. They want these numbers presented consistently across organizations, and that really is the goal. They do clarify in this standard as well that only the service cost component is eligible to be capitalized into inventory or into assets or even internally development, develop software or anything of that nature. You can only look at the service cost component and not the total expense, so you can never be capitalizing any portions of the interest or actuarial gains or losses into these assets. So some consistency, good news or bad news, not really sure, just something you need to be aware of. And the last one related to compensation is stock compensation, um, scope of modification accounting. And they said, you know, some people are saying we've modified our stock options or something of that nature. And others are saying, no, we didn't. This really doesn't trigger us to change our accounting. And they go through here under number two that it is a modification unless really you haven't changed anything is all pretty much what it says. So the modified award has to have the same fair value as the original award. The vesting conditions have to be the same and it has to be the same type of instrument. So really, if you've changed any of the key components, you do have to go through modification accounting and go through that process to make sure that you're accounting for this properly. That concludes compensation. So our next topic, um, not-for-profit entities, um, for those of you um, who are not-for-profits or those of you who sit on not-for-profit boards, you'll be affected by this or if you're even a potential donor to certain nonprofits and you look at their financial statements. So this was released in August of 2016. Um, and we really haven't had significant changes to not-for-profit accounting since 1993. So this really is a pretty big deal. And they spent a lot of time reaching out to not-for-profit organizations and users of those financial statements to determine what would be the most beneficial. So this standard is coming up on us pretty quickly. It's for fiscal years beginning after December 15, 2017. So for calendar year nonprofits, 12-31-18. Um, and then for some of those off-cycle nonprofits, 331s and 630s and even 930s, this will hit you in 2019. And you will need comparative information for this standard. So let's look at um, the, the, uh, the major things that have changed. So it's going to affect everyone, um, not-for-profits, charities, foundations, private colleges, universities, um, healthcare providers, religious organizations, trade associations. So pretty much any nonprofit is pulled into this standard, and they're trying to meet the needs of all the different types of users that use these financial statements. So what are the changes? They really fall into five major categories. And the biggest one is really to get our mindset around what our finances are going to look like and to change our terminology. So it's the net asset classification. So right now we have unrestricted net assets, we have temporarily restricted net assets, and permanently restricted net assets. So we have three categories. This is going to take us down to two categories. It's either with donor restriction or without donor restriction. So if you think about the bottom of your balance sheet or statement of financial position, you're only going to have two categories categories there and your statement of changes in net assets instead of having the three different columns you're only going to have two columns it's either with a donor restriction or without a donor restriction um, so on the face of the statements you will not no longer be able to see what is permanently restricted because things anything with a restriction will be grouped together the next change is the investment return. So there will be a lot more disclosures around any underwater endowment funds. So what that footnote looks like, what you're saying about your endowments, and anything that's falling below the original donated value, you're going to have to disclose a lot more around what you're doing related to those endowments. And the investment return also needs to be disclosed net of all related internal and external and direct internal expenses. Um, 
originally you had to break all these out and there was a lot of concern about that because the internal expenses, if you had one person managing your investments internally, you could be disclosing their salary. They have said you are now allowed to net them all together as the expenses, but you do have to show that investment return net of all of these costs. So that will be a new disclosure as well. The third thing is expenses. And you have to present your expenses by both nat both the natural and functional classification. Um, so a lot of times you had your statement of functional expenses that was either in a footnote or that was another schedule to your financial statements. This clarifies that it has to be all in one statement and all in one place. So some of you are already doing that, but for some of you, this will change the presentation there. In terms of the statement of cash flows, you are now given a choice between the direct method or the indirect method. For those of you that are doing the direct method, you will no longer have to reconcile that through the indirect method. So that, that portion goes away. So maybe a little bit of good news there if you're using the direct method. If you are using the indirect method, nothing has to change. And the last one, um, which is potentially the most controversial of all of these, is liquidity and availability of resources. So this is qualitative and quantitative information about the, va the availability of resources to meet cash needs within one year of the balance sheet date. So a lot of the examples that they put out there is here's the cash I have, the receivables, the pledges receivable, all the, the current assets that I have that can pay my current liabilities, including my line of credits and current portion of long-term debt, and explaining to the reader um, how you're going to meet all of those obligations, particularly if it isn't obvious that you have the, the current assets readily available to do so. What's really interesting about this is public companies, you know, have a lot of disclosures about forward looking information, but private companies currently do not. And the FASB actually has the non for profit industry kind of leading the charge with these forward looking information to look into the next year. So certainly a bit controversial, but the examples they put out there are are rather short. Uh, most of them are about a third to a half of a page. So you have your table of these um, assets, current assets and current liabilities, and then a paragraph describing the steps management's going to take, but definitely a big shift in what has been disclosed in the past. So that is what's coming for not-for-profit entities. So I'm going to turn it back over to Mike for our last topic of the day. Sure. So in the interest of um, being almost out of time and the fact that this is an exposure draft, uh, we'll just talk real briefly on this topic. And it's something that is, I think, of significant importance to accounting firms uh, that perform employee benefit plan audits. Uh, but it is also something to be aware of if you are a, a plan sponsor or work at a plan sponsor or even a participant in a employee benefit plan. Um, the last three years have been uh, an area of real, real close scrutiny by the Department of Labor on how accounting firms are approaching employee benefit plan audits. There are uh, a lot of studies being done. Uh, in 2015, a study was done of about 400 uh, benefit plan audits done by accounting firms, uh, 230 different CPA firms, and the, uh, the Department of Labor found that roughly 40% of those didn't meet their expectations. Uh, I would tell you, and I think Janice would agree that uh, some of their expectations and standards are uh, a little bit, um, I'll use the word ridiculous, uh, and there are things <laughs> they consider to be deficiencies that I think most, uh, most accountants and most auditors would not necessarily agree are significant issues. But fact remains, the Department of Labor is the one that governs benefit plans, uh, and so it is, it is on us as an industry to make sure we meet their expectations, and clearly at least 40% of the time uh, our industry is not meeting their expectations. So through that process, uh, the Department of Labor approached the AICPA and said, what can we do about this? How do we make these audits better? Uh, and the AICPA has recently put out an exposure draft, uh, which comment period ends uh, in the next few days here. So there's still an opportunity if you read it and decide you don't like it to send some commentary in. And there is quite a bit of commentary already coming in, uh, but it will really reshape how employee benefit plan audits are performed. Uh, and a lot of that will involve putting additional onus on both the accounting firm and on management. So there's a few things on your screen uh, we won't go through in detail. 
But I do want you to be aware that uh, there will be changes coming to the audit approach. If you're involved in the employee benefit plan audit at your organization, uh, you should expect to hear from your accounting firm in the next year about some significant changes to how these will be approached. And most importantly, if you're a member of management who's involved in those plan audits, uh, the onus is going to be a little bit more significant on you. So uh, you should be hearing about that. And I'm, I'm comfortable that uh, McConley and Asbury Benefit Plan Audit clients will hear about it uh, if this goes through. Uh, and if it does go through, it would be effective after December 15th, 2018. So uh, your plan audits that begin as soon as next year uh, could be a little bit more significant uh, in terms of what ex is expected of management and how the audit firm and, and the, uh, the sponsor work together. So uh, certainly don't have enough time to dig into the 200 some pages of detail that are in this exposure draft, but stay tuned. Uh, and I'm quite certain that uh, our partner, Dan Sturm, will be spending an hour on a webinar with you once this is final explaining how things have changed. So uh, with that, uh, and in light of the time, we see there's a few questions from a few of you. The beauty of, uh, of our, our system here is that we can see who asked the question. So we'll get back to you directly on your answers. Uh, we won't continue to hold those of you who are on the line. Uh, they're fairly narrow questions, not broad applicability. Uh, so we'll respond to you with your questions. And with that, I uh, thank you for your time today. I uh, appreciate your patience with the fire hose approach to FASB updates, mm -hmm. uh, things that could have taken days. We managed to do in about 55 minutes here. Uh, and as there are, are questions, and I'm sure there will be more detailed and nuanced questions, please feel free to reach out to either Janice or I. Our contact information is on your screen, uh, and we'd be happy to work with you to answer any of those specific questions. So with that, I will turn it back over to Tyler to close us out. Thank you once again for joining us for this presentation produced by McConley and Asbury. We hope you join us for our upcoming events. You can stay up to date with news and learn more about our upcoming events by visiting us at www.macpas.com. Thanks again and have a great day.